Good day, friends. I'm Kerry Dillinger. You've tuned in to Bible Class Topics, and you're here to study with me Peter's second letter, and we're going to bring this study to a close in just a few minutes. Chapter 3, we're going to look at verses 11 through 18. If you've missed any of the videos from this study, I'll put a link to the playlist in the description below, and I'll try to remember to also link it in the end card of this video as well. Thank you for joining me this late in the study. It's been quite a remarkable study through this verse, uh, these verses of Peter's second letter. So much is there for us to learn. So much is there for us to put into practice in our own lives and to help us defend the faith. Be ready to give an answer for the reason of the fact that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. Let's get our Bibles out. Let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to pick up in just a moment in verse 11 of that chapter. Here's the synopsis of the chapter. In the last lesson, we looked at verses 1 through 10. You see that on the left side of your screen. And today, we want to finish this uh, outline by looking at the moral dynamic, hastening the day, final exhortations. will include perverters of the scripture, beware, watch out for those, and the fact that as Christians we need a firm foundation and Jesus expects us to continually grow. The Gospels, the letters of the Apostles and the New Testament writers provide us with a moral dynamic. We see where our morality comes from. And we see where our morality can go, either following in the footsteps of Jesus, or we can leave him and go off on our own direction. So let's read verses 11 through 14 of chapter 3. Peter continues, Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which the righteousness will dwell. So as we conclude this chapter and we conclude this short letter, as we as individuals approach the second coming, we are expected to live a life of purity and holiness. If we expect to enter the new heaven and the new earth with the righteous, we must seek daily with all of our mind, our heart, our soul, and strength to fit ourselves in such a way as we can dwell there. If there is not a second coming, then our lives are going nowhere. In his commentary on this book, James Burton Kaufman had this to say, the great ethical purpose of Christianity is clear. Christ came to save people from their sins, not in their sins. And the recognition of the ultimate fate of all created things, to say nothing of the immediate fate of all mortals, should have but one issue, that of godliness and holy living. Barclay, in his commentary, decided to write some epitaphs that the heathens can have inscribed on their tombstones. They're not very happy to read. Here's a couple of them. If nothing is to come, we might as well eat, drink, and be merry. Wow, I don't want that on my tombstone. If there's nothing to live for, there's nothing wrong with being indifferent. I came from nowhere, now I will go to nowhere. 
it's really of no concern. Aren't those sad things for someone to be saying at the end of their life? Meanwhile, in view of the transitory nature of the world and all things that belong to it, children of God should cease their concern about it and fix their attention and set their sights on eternal matters. See what Paul has to say in 2 Corinthians 4.18. In verse 14 of our current reading in Peter's letter, Kaufman had this to say. Peter makes it clear that only holiness and righteousness shall survive in the eternal world. And his admonition warns the Christians, that is, his readers, to strive toward the eternal values. All else will eventually fail anyway. But what about hastening the day? The New Testament tells us how the second coming may be hurried along. It may be hurried along by praying for Christ to come quickly. Preaching the gospel, according to Matthew 24, 14, might bring the second coming quick, quicker. Spreading the gospel worldwide, we see, would hasten the king's coming. We may hasten the day by repentance and obedience. The Jewish rabbis were known to say if Israel would perfectly keep the law for one day, the Messiah would come. In true repentance and absolute obedience, a person opens their heart to the coming of the king and brings near that coming throughout the world. The coldness of our heart and disobedience, our personal disobedience, is what delays the coming of the king. What do we know about the nature and the characteristics of this new heaven and new earth? Do we know where they'll be located? Do we even know what they are? As we read our Bibles, we're led to believe the new heaven and earth will follow the destruction of the present heavens and the present earth. The new earth, the earth that then will be, is not this earth. This earth is what embodies the hopes and expectations of the future kingdom's place. Also, regardless of what you might hear from the denominational pulpits around the world, there is no hint of a reign of Christ on this earth which Peter describes. Christ will have terminated his reign and delivered the kingdom to the Father before the events are accomplished, which the apostle here details. See also Paul's writings in 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 23 and following. There is, therefore, no support whatsoever for the premillennial theory to be found in this passage of Scripture that we're reading from Second Peter. What conclusion can we make concerning the new heaven and the new earth? Personally, I conclude that the phrase the new heavens and the new earth must be understood as a designation for the eternal heaven, the place that the righteous will live with God in the after a while. Now Peter will make some final exhortations in these last verses. Let's go ahead and finish reading the chapter beginning in verse uh, 14 and we'll read on down. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace and count the patience of our Lord as salvation just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him as he does in all of his letters when he speaks in them of these matters there are some things in them that are hard to understand 
which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Peter and Paul agree, but the false teachers and prophets, the false teachers and the false prophets, are neither in agreement among themselves nor in agreement with Peter and Paul. That's what Peter tells us here. Well, regarding what exactly? What is this agreement? Peter and Paul agreed that the fact that God, withholding his hand, is never to be used as an excuse for sinning, but always as a means of repentance and an opportunity for a positive change. To see what Paul had to say, check out Romans 2, verse 4, Romans 3, 25, and Romans 9, 22. What do we learn from Peter's estimation of Paul's teaching? Well, namely, that his letters contained some things that were difficult to understand. We don't know how many of Paul's letters were known to Peter at this point in time. At least some of Paul's writings were known. And yes, they were difficult to understand by who or whom those who lack knowledge, and those who were willing to twist the writings of Paul as well as other scriptures to their own destruction. Peter considered Paul's letters to be scripture. Well, is Peter issuing a con commendation or a condemnation concerning Paul's writings? It's pretty obvious that he is commending Paul's writings, and he's also commending careful careful, careful study of those writings. Peter is, is not issuing a condemnation of Paul's writings. He is warning the readers of those writings to be careful. Ignorant men were the ones twisting Paul's doctrine of grace into an excuse and even a reason for sin. See Romans chapter 6. False teachers turned Paul's doctrine of Christian freedom into an excuse for unchristian license. Galatians 5.13 Paul's doctrine of faith was twisted into an argument that Christian action was unimportant. In other words, Faith only saves. James, the Lord's brother, clarifies the fact that that is not true in James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. The unteachable are persons whose passions blind their understanding and make them averse to truth. That's what James McKnight had to say about these ignorant people that want to twist the scriptures. They're unteachable. And let me paraphrase something Barclay had to say as he was closing out his commentary on this letter. The tragedy of life is when one twists Christian truth and Holy Scripture into an excuse and even a reason for doing what we want to do instead of taking them as guides for doing what God wants us to do. The destruction mentioned is caused by twisting of the scriptures by evil men. The destruction is not due to the scripture or its writers. The destruction is due to its improper handling by evil men. The passage does not teach that all scripture is difficult to understand and should not be read. The passage does not support the view that man needs an infallible interpreter of scriptures. What is taught is that some scripture is hard to understand and that evil men utilize those scriptures for their own ungodly purposes. The lesson for us is that we should guard against any interpretation contrary to the general teaching of the Bible. Paul's writings were generally accepted as scripture and Peter, 
another inspired man, regarded them as such. Now we bring us, that brings us to our last two verses. Let's read them together. Verse 17 and 18. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you're not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Of course, we read that again, but what a beautiful doxology this is. It's worth our reading it again. A firm foundation and continual growth, that's what we need. The Christian is forewarned. The Christian cannot plead ignorance. The Christian knows the difference between right and wrong. The Christian lean, learns, I should say, to expect a cross to bear and has been warned there will always be those ready to attack and pervert the faith. The person who knows the right and does the wrong is under double condemnation. So the Christian is forewarned. The Christian has a basis for living. The Christian is to be rooted and grounded in the faith. The Christian believes in a specific basis of belief that never changes. The number one belief is that Jesus Christ is Lord. See Philippians 2.11. Christians will always be aware of their duty of making their life fit their belief, not make their belief fit their life. The Christian is forewarned. The Christian has a basis for living. The Christian possesses a developing life. A developing life, not stagnant. Not going backwards, but developing. Each day we must experience the wonder of grace and grow in the gifts that grace can bring. Each day we must enter more and more deeply into the wonder of Jesus Christ. The Christian life is a life with a firm foundation growing ever outward and looking ever upward. Peter concludes his letter by giving the glory to Christ then, now, and to the end of time. In his doxology, Peter puts Christ on an equality with God. He says that Christ is central and crucial. Christ shares the glory of eternal God. Christ is to be glorified now, and Christ is the glory of that eternal day that encompasses and fulfills all of our days. Albert Barnett in his commentary on Second Peter. This short letter is a triumphant affirmation of a magnificent faith in Christ. Such a production is utterly beyond the power of any human being to forge. Only a very few men who ever lived on earth could have written a letter like Second Peter. And those men were the apostles who heard Jesus Christ deliver the discourse record recorded in Matthew chapter 24. Kaufman concludes his comments on 2 Peter with this statement. The entire letter of 2 Peter carries the inherent hallmarks of integrity, authenticity, and the true inspiration of the Holy Spirit. A magnificent faith in Christ, beyond the power of any human. Jesus gave us apostles who witnessed Jesus Christ as he walked this very earth. In Peter's letter, shows integrity of its author, the authenticity of the things he has to say, and the fact that he was truly inspired by the Holy Spirit. Well, that brings us to a close here in Second Peter. I hope you've in, enjoyed the, our study, and I hope that you use these things that we had to say to f forge further study concerning these letters of Peter. In the next few days, perhaps within the week, 
we'll begin our study of Jude, the Lord's Brother's short letter, one chapter, just a few verses. We want to look at that in connection with our study of 2 Peter, because 2 Peter 2 and Jude uh, chapter 1, there is only one chapter, have, have much in common, and so we can compare those since we've just recently studied 2 Peter chapter 2. So that's something for us to look forward to in the weeks to come. I hope that you'll plan to be with me for that study. It's in preparation as we speak today. Thank you so much for making it this far in the video. If you did, you are one of my best subscribers and it is greatly appreciated. Speaking of subscription, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. Give the video a like or even a dislike. Make a comment. All those things are appreciated. We hope to be back together with you to study very, very soon. Until then, may God bless.